I need to get some money. I'll give you a check tonight. I'll give you a Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get this uh, meeting started. Uh, the council asked Mr. Walden sometime back to uh, look at our de design standards and uh, try to move us forward into the 21st century a little bit and bring us some ideas on what, what else is out there these days. Uh, we've got two groups scheduled to speak tonight, and the first group uh, was, is with Rick Sal Architecture. Uh, there are two speakers, Cody Ferris and Rick Sal. Uh, Rick, since your name's on the uh, building out front, you can pick who you want to come up first. I was just informed that I would be first, and so I asked if uh, there were going to be questions that were going to be asked of me, and I was told no. And I said, well, that's too bad because I don't have any comments prepared. I am happy to uh, ramble on and on about our experiences and what we think. And... <laughs> So that I don't get off in the weeds, Mr. Mayor, can you tell me exactly what our focus should be? Just make sure that I don't get where I shouldn't be. Yeah, it's, it's design materials that are, you're seeing in uh, different parts of the country, uh, Northwest Arkansas. Uh, our design standards, when were they updated? 20 years ago? It's been a long time. It's been a while. So there are a lot of new uh, things on the market. I know yes. that there's a lot of new metals. Uh, there's EFAS. There's a lot of different masonry uh, okay. available. So just okay. speak on those things. All right, very good. Well, it's probably appropriate that, uh, that I'm up here. I've been around here in Conway for a long time and uh, spent a lot of time with the previous regime discussing these kinds of things. As a matter of fact, Mayor Townsell and I uh, made a trip to uh, North Texas many years ago at the time that he was... Uh, exploring what he felt like material lists should be here in Conway. And so uh, we went to primarily to Frisco, Texas, a little in McKinney, a little in Allen, but primary Frisco. Frisco was a really uh, hot place at the time. And Frisco's focus was pretty much 100% on brick. They wanted all the buildings to be brick. They wanted all the buildings to have sort of the same tone. And I think uh, Mayor Townsell's vision for Conway at the time was he liked the idea of brick town. That's the way that I refer to it. And so uh, down through the years, we have tried to adhere to the 51% brick uh, standard, but have found on many, many occasions that we felt like it was preventing the city from getting good architecture. Now you can go all over Conway and you can find buildings that are 100% brick. And in my opinion, a lot of those are not going to be good architecture. On the other hand, I think we've been passing up what I would consider to be good architecture by the world standards today, by the good architects around the world, because we're not allowing certain products. Um, and two, not allow things like uh, aluminum panels or horizontal ribbed panels. And I'll go as far as to say even sometimes uh, our panels, uh, there are appropriate places I think for a lot of different materials. Uh, and I think uh, that, that probably more often than not, they need to actually be looked at in the context in which they're being drawn up. And I'll give you a quick example. Right now we have this requirement for 51% brick on uh, exposed building elevations. We are frustrated at the moment, along with a client of ours out on Blaney Hill Road who wanted to do in the middle of a bunch of warehouses out there, he wants to do a uh, warehouse, small warehouse addition, just because he needs more storage space. Well, the requirement in the city right now is that 51% of each elevation of that warehouse, and it's a, it's a budded to the existing building, so you got three brand new exposed sides, that 51% of each one of those sides has to, has to be brick. And so that will be the only brick in that Blaney Hill Road area, I mean the only building in that Blaney Hill Road area that has brick on it. And uh, to me, that is not a good place to put brick. Now, it's not a commercial area. If it were downtown, obviously, if it were out uh, in one of the um, new developments, a 51% brick would make a whole lot more sense. But 
The client's not really happy that he's having to do the 51. Yes, sir. Yes. Zoned industrial. I thought industrial zones that that did not apply. And I don't think it is in zoned industrial. Is it not, is it not zoned industrial? Yeah. It, okay. No, it's a commercial zoning. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you. It, but the point, if it were industrial, I probably wouldn't even be bringing it up. But the yeah. point, the point I'm, I'm exactly trying to not. make, David, is that um, it, things need to be looked at in the context of where they are. Uh, and I agree that 51% brick would look good on a lot of facilities and a lot of places, uh, but it, but not in that lo that particular location. So I think one of the key words you'll hear from our firm tonight is the word context. And uh, we, we agree 100% with standards, uh, quality control, and we want buildings to look good in Conway, but we feel like that we have passed up a lot of what we would consider good architecture, even award-winning architecture at times, just because of something like a 51% brick requirement, which in my opinion does not define architecture. I lived in Richland Hills for a number of years and they had a standard out there that every mailbox had to be made out of brick and had to be this rectangular. I, I, personally, I didn't find that attractive at all. So I went and bought a really expensive, very nice cast aluminum, beautiful European style mailbox and put it in and the, the very next day I got a, a letter from the President of the Homeowners Association. And not, I'm not mentioning any names, but the next day my mailbox got bashed in by uh, somebody with a steel bar. So, way off the subject. I should have come and complained at that time. <laughs> That's been many years ago. But the point is that, that I think there's some really good opportunities sometimes that don't have anything to do with brick. Um, let me just, this is not my building, so I can bring this, but the, but the Chi Alpha House out on the university campus uh, could not be built under the city of Conway standards, but it was a nice building. It's a nice modern building. We're not we're not seeing a lot of modern, up-to-date architecture. Uh, a lot of it because we're we're required to have 51% brick on the on elevations. But there are a lot of good products out there. We see a lot of the uh, ACMs, the uh, aluminum composition uh, panels. Uh, and we used a little of that on the Conway Corp headquarters. You guys are familiar with those uh, aluminum panels we put on there. That is a great product. It is an uh, uh, it's, it's an upgrade primarily and uh, has a really definite upscale look to it uh, and, and should be allowed, uh, in my opinion. And I would hate to eliminate that and say that it has to be brick instead. Uh, and masonry has a unique uh, interpretation sometime. Uh, not too long ago, uh, we tried to use a burnished block on a building and we were told that it didn't qualify. Well, it's a lot more expensive than a lot of the masonry that we would use. And a burnished block, in my opinion, is a very attractive product. Uh, and I hated it that we weren't able to use it on that particular project. So, yes, sir. It's like a concrete block, except it's got uh, particular um, uh, elements in it, and it's, and it's polished. You know, you know, you know what a con polished concrete floor looks like. These are a burnished, polished face of a block that in my opinion is really attractive and you get some really rich colors in there and in, in my opinion it should be allowed as an exterior material I think it's gorgeous and I and I think that in a lot of cases um, different products are appropriate and I, like I mentioned I'll even go so far as to say that I think in some cases our panels are appropriate and I think it would have been an appropriate product on the Blaney Hill Road I would not do it on a downtown office building we just finished uh, American Safeguard insurance a building down on Bob Courtway Drive. I wouldn't do an R panel on that project. Uh, so I, I think contact text is something we need to look at. And I'll, I'll go. What is the name of what? Do you, what are you calling these panel? The, R, I'm sorry. It's it's the ribbed metal panels that you see primarily on warehouse buildings and pre-engineered oh, okay. steel structures. Sorry. Um, which, and I understand. I understand an ordinance to restrict the use of those on most buildings, and I think that's fine. I'm just saying that occasionally, I think there's a, an appropriate opportunity to use to use those. And and I'll go so far as to say I'm, I'm not an EFAS fan. Do I need to explain what an EFAS is? Drive it, um, exterior insulation and finish system. You guys see this all over the place, uh, even on a lot of homes. I am not a fan of that. I, I think it stains too easily. I think birds like to build nests in it too much. I think it, um, I think it gets waterlogged, or a lot of it does, depending on the installation. I just think there are a lot of problems with driving it. I'm not a big fan. But I'll go so far as to say that I think occasionally there is an appropriate use of drive it. 
it's really good for, for detailing and for achieving some kind of look that you want to do. I, I, don't, I don't like putting it on the facade of a building, and I certainly don't like it down close to the ground where it can da get damaged or stained. But I just think that things need to be looked at a little closer in context uh, so that we can use more up-to-date, uh, newly developed materials. Like a, I'm going to throw out the, the word Nichiwa, if you guys have ever heard of it. It's, it's a metal panel. Um, you're, you're seeing a lot of metal panels these days that have a wood look to it. And they've got, uh, there's some great products, and, and uh, we would love to be able to use some of that. Uh, but I just think there's a lot of new modern materials that could be used if we simply accept more materials, maybe review them on an individual basis, and maybe get rid of the 51% brick. I feel like I'm starting to ramble now, so if anybody has any questions. Yeah, Rick, I have a couple questions. One, do you think, thinking about how to construct an ordinance around or make changes to it, do you think it would be better for us to maybe clearly identify what we don't want versus having a list of things you know, instead of saying 51% masonry, saying what we don't want is a solid metal building, or we don't, you know, so I'm kind of thinking that. And, and then also some of the products that you're mentioning, I think part of what was behind it originally was the long-term maintenance, how it looks, how it can be cared for. Yes. You know, do all, are all these products that you're talking about have different levels of, of I guess, longevity and maintenance I, issues and things like that? Y yes, they would. And, uh, but I think that list of restricted products should be fairly small, in my opinion. Uh, vinyl siding, I, I doubt if that will ever be one that passes. Um, but yes, there are some maintenance issues on some products, and that's one of the issues that I have with Drive It. But, but I'm not standing here saying let's eliminate Drive It because it's got some maintenance issues. In my opinion, it's got an appropriate appropriate use in some places. Yeah, let's just don't make it a, either a completely restricted product or let's don't make it a completely acceptable product, you know, that needs to go. I, I think it just needs to be examined. And maybe I'm asking too much, but um, we've worked in cities before. And by the way, the city of Conway is getting very difficult to work with, uh, comparatively speaking. We've worked in a lot of cities down through the years. We've been in business here since 95. So... Uh, Oh, don't make me add that up. 27 years. <laughs> and so um, the, I know it's a process, and there are a lot of cities uh, that we work with, but they do allow what we consider to be good architecture. And uh, I just think we're m missing the, the boat sometime. And I don't know if that answered your question no, or not, No, it does Shelley. a little bit. And, and so more building it into you know, part of the whole building review process that allows some flexibility. I think so, yeah, and, and it, maybe it's the building review process that we need to go through, uh, and, but I, what I don't want to do, and I agree with standards, please understand that, what I don't want it to do is just to leave it up to the subjective opinion of, no offense, Jane, but, <laughs> and I, or Shelley, or, or whomever. Uh, I, I do agree that there need to be standards, but there need to be loose enough so that good projects can be created and designed and built. I just think we're missing out on a lot of really interesting, good architecture. And if you study good architecture around the globe, it's not all 51% brick. Oftentimes, it's very far from it. Yes? Well, I want to ask him. I want to, I want to make a quick statement, short, and ask and ask one question. <laughs> the, when we started this 51%, uh, the reason we started it be because we didn't want melt buildings abandoned and nobody wanted to rent them. And we had some of that then. And you were talking about the ethos not being, how low to the ground do you think it should be? Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm the right person to, to well, give me make that judgment, but what I will tell you is that I have seen too, ma too many EFIS installations damaged by rain splatters mm -hmm. and damaged by lawnmower contact. Uh, and so I really think it needs to be several feet above the ground. Now, I don't know if that means four feet or 10 feet or whatever, but 
I, I, I do think EFIS needs to be used in limitation, and that's a personal opinion of mine. Is that, can, is that a cheaper product versus other products out uh, on the market? Well, uh, compared to other products, it would be cheaper, but it's not as cheap. It's, I mean, it's not the cheap solution. Um, so you don't use it because it's a cheap solution. You use it because you like the looks of it. You know? And for example, if you're using EFIS in lieu of brick, there are a lot of structural issues with brick. For example, if you're going across a big, long storefront, you can put EFIS over there without any additional structural support. But if you're going to put brick up there, you got to have a lot of steel in there to support it. So a lot of times EFIS is used to span uh, openings, things like that. I think we just don't want to get into, into developers wanting to use the less cheaper products out there than something that looks more aesthetically pleasing yeah. to the job. And I guess that's, you know, a balancing to, and, you know. And let me make one more comment about materials and then I'll sit down and you can hear from somebody else. Uh, right now, I know that, that uh, cement fiber siding is an acceptable product in lieu of masonry. And I do like hardy board and that type of product, I like it a lot. Uh, one of the things though that we're seeing in commercial architecture is uh, horizontal lap siding, which is not typically a commercial look, more of a residential look, but it is accepted as a replacement for brick. There are a lot of different cement fiber siding products out, of, out there that have a different look other than uh, Joanna Gaines shiplap siding, you know. And so we like to use it in a number of ways. Um, and I know, and I appreciate James. He's been flexible on allowing us to do that more lately, and so we appreciate that. But there's just a there's just a lot of I think subtle differences with what's going on here. And I would love to see, and, and maybe maybe we go to other cities who are doing something successful and take a look at that. But I think we need to both loosen up in some areas and tighten up in others. I have a quick. I'm sorry. Go ahead, David. No, I think we did this because I was on the council when we did this. It's it's maybe 15 years ago, Tab was mayor, about 15 years ago maybe. And you know, what you said, Theo, that the main thing was to get rid of mm -hmm. you know, solid metal buildings in, in places that didn't belong. They belong in some places. They belong in that warehouse. But some places they just don't. They're getting places where they don't. But it was broader than that. I mean, when, that's kind of what kick-started, but it was much broader than that. Um, as far as you know, James having leeway, I know there's got to be some balance there, but I know James sometimes expresses frustration that he's the one that's got to make the call. Right, you know, because a lot of this, some of this, some of this is simply aesthetics. What do you like? What do you don't like? Mm -hmm. A lot of it, though, is durability, value. What's going to last? You know, longevity. If I'm going to invest in a building over here, I want to make sure the guy next to me doesn't not, or you know, it damages the value of my building. But there's so there's you know the fine line mm -hmm. in between there, and your input's been very helpful. I got a couple of pictures. If you could ask. And you may not be able to tell from looking at these pictures, but what, what are those I've circled? Is that is that hardy board? Is that what is, well, it's it's hard to tell. Are? This is the the gable of uh, Bank OZK. It's hard to tell. It's a it's a white, fairly smooth material. My guess is it's going to be EFIS. David, if you look up at the vent up yeah. in the top of the gable, you can see the, the the trim around the vent. You can't accomplish that with a lot of materials, but you can do okay. it really well with EFIS. And so that's what I'm going to guess this is. Okay. But it could be hardy board. Okay. And there's a couple more. I mean, probably the same thing. Along the same lines, the um, Richie Arnold Innovation Center. Does Is that real wood or is that metal? No, that's metal siding with the wow. wood look. Yeah. Very no, popular today. There. There and in my opinion, it's used a lot of good ways. Okay, I'm going to... This does give me an opportunity to say something. I, I'm probably taking everything Cody has to say to you guys. This, this is a shopping center, and it's the signage band up high, uh, away from the ground, and, and it looks like it's possibly EFIS. And I think this is probably a good use of EFIS. You can get some really nice shapes up there. It's up off the ground. When a tenant moves out and takes his sign, you can repair the damage that's done to the face of the EFIS like it's never been done. If that were brick or if that were almost anything else, It'd be very difficult to repair. So I think EFIS has its place, just not everywhere all the time. And turn to that last picture, you may see if that looks like EFIS, you can see a sign came down, number four, Mose. And I guess, you know, at some point you could repair that. Okay, yeah. Again, it's hard to tell I'm, from just looking at that it, picture. It is. And again, it could be EFIS. And of course, Mose has been there for a long time. Yeah. So they recently changed out their brand sign. and. 
Did, it, did a different one. I'm, I'm going to guess, David, that's EFIS. Uh, okay. I don't I don't think there was much use of Hardy Board around here at the time this okay. was done. Okay. Thank you. All right. And, and by the way, I think uh, <clears throat> I think the 51% uh, brick was probably a reaction to the EM Jeans building that we designed because the whole back of it is metal panels. And I think the city probably had enough metal panels at that time. So <laughs> I'm probably as much to blame as anybody. <laughs> Cody, I think you're up. Good evening. Uh, Rick did touch on most everything I was going to talk about. Who, who are you with? Uh, Sal Architects. I'm Cody Ferris. And, you know, the real, the real thing we're kind of after looking at is the limitations that the 51% is putting. And it, it's kind of a blanket statement across the city without taking too much context into account. And there's anomalies. Every site's unique. And one thing I think it was put in place for the brick was to bring bad buildings up to a better standard. But what it does is it also, from an architectural standpoint, limits great buildings. So, for instance, you couldn't build like the Clinton Library in Conway. It's just not allowed. The tennis center's technically not allowed. Andes isn't allowed. Um, the Chi Omega building's a great building. It's not allowed. So looking for opportunities for that flexibility uh, use of other materials that are of good standard quality. And uh, there are tons of new materials. They change monthly. And, you know, even EFIS, there, EFIS for a while was always a better alternative than a stucco. But it can, it can pose a problem when water gets behind it. Well, I think that technology has also changed. They have drainable EFIS, so there's a cavity behind there so that water that does get behind there has a place to go and doesn't just mold and rot. So even within, you know, materials that at one point had a little bit of a problem, there's new developments, new technologies. Uh, there's TRESPA panels. Um, I'd like to retract a little bit of a statement on Arnold Innovation Center. That's Nichiha. It is a fiber cement product like James Hardy but it's got an integral wood look um, finish to it so that it warms it up and, you know, it was just another alternative to a painted hardy siding. Um, we've tried in the past in some of the historic areas with some new durable metal wood look paneling systems. You see it on banks, Taco Bells are pretty prominent right now with their prototypes. And using a material in a historic district that's not the material naturally that it is like a wood siding, you, you kind of run into problems. So like a hardy board was a good alternative for that. Um, but there are some great products out there um, other than just brick. So sometimes those regulations limit what we can do, even if it is a better quality. Um, same with metal panel. You know, our panels kind of frowned upon, but there's insulated backed panel that's, you know, $200 a square foot that's crazy expensive, good look. It's a whole system for the building, but we can't use it. So sometimes when there's regulations, there's also drawbacks to what you can use creatively. So that's about all I got. I appreciate it. Thank you. Nabholes, Mark, you or uh, Jeff, uh, whichever one you want to step up. Yeah, that'd be great. No, we're just we're just contractors. We have to go through the paperwork. <laughs> uh, like Mark mentioned, my name is Jeff Markison with Nabholtz. Uh, I work in our pre-construction group, and for those of you who don't know what that is exactly, it's I deal on the costing side of things, and so I look at initial cost, life cycle cost, and kind of the different materials that are prescribed by the design team as we move forward with the project. Um, and so I'll be talking a little bit about what some of your questions were had to do with from the standpoint of durability and cost for the variety of things that we're seeing um, throughout the construction industry today. So like I mentioned, I have a, a nice little handout here um, that, again, has a couple of images and then some data that's probably boring but interesting nonetheless. So on the first few slides here, I've got what we typically are seeing. Again, a lot of these are based in Conway just for point of reference, but some masonry built buildings and structures. Masonry, again, like you heard from the architectural side of things, can be defined in a multitude of ways, brick, block, 
um, you know, stone, a variety of materials as we see it from that standpoint. Um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, there's been reference to other areas um, of the state, specifically Northwest Arkansas, but some of the metal panels we're seeing there, again, that's something that was alluded to of, of some requirements that are allowed now with ACM or the aluminum composite panel that is allowed currently in the, in the area, but then there's some of the other multitude of panels that go a variety of different ways that are on that third slide there that have a, a multitude of ways to look at um, and are a good durable product. And I'm gonna talk about cost here in a minute. And then from the standpoint of EFIS or applied type finishes that go on, again, that's something that's fairly commonplace, again, as, as prescribed earlier and depending on locations, but again, that's something that is commonplace uh, on a variety of, of project types as we've seen it. So kind of the nuts and bolts of what we look at as we get into the pre-construction phase and we start looking at a project and the cost is obviously day one cost, which is very important to anyone, whether it's you're, you're the owner, developer, or whomever, because that's, that's real dollars that happens that day. We also look at life cycle. What's it gonna look like five years from now, 10 years from now, 20, 50, you know, how far into, in perpetuity do we go? So a lot of this data that you have in front of you now is, is from a University of Florida study that I pulled up and was able to get. Um, also looked at different manufacturers from the ones that have been mentioned with Drive It, Stowe, also with Kingspan, Nichiha, as well as the National Concrete Masonry Association to try and get a good range of, of, of data to pull from. Essentially what we're looking at when we see the building is again, something that's, that's designed already for us. And then we start applying cost factors to that. When we come up with opportunities to try and save money, some of the things that we're looking at is not going to a lesser product, making sure people understand what that value is so that again, we're saving money on day one, but how does that impact it on down the road? So again, we still look at, as you'll see kind of in that, that fifth slide there with uh, fire resistance, weatherproofing, you've heard about moisture issues and what, what's been changed there. Uh, right now, the market availability. And so what kind of issues we have from that standpoint, again, some of the images y'all just talked about was what happens if something changes? Can you go in and find that material to improve it? Or are you stuck with a blemish um, for the life cycle of that building? Energy efficiency, acoustics, durability, color, all those sorts of things are, are items that we review before we just come in and say, hey, let's go and change a product out. And so again, some of these, these charts that you'll see in front of you here have to look at a variety of things, but a couple of things that I think of, of note are first cost, and then obviously your life cycle cost, and then your O&M, your operation and maintenance cost. The rest of it's kind of filler, and that's good if you're really bored one evening. But again, those other kind of items are what we really need to look at. So if you want to break it down in kind of a nutshell, when you think about that, that, that initial day one cost, Typically, masonry had been one of the items that would be more expensive because it's labor involved, the intensity that it happens there, and then you know the process of putting that up versus an applied type finish or a metal panel system. Again, we reference multiple metal panels out there now. The R panel that's more your traditional warehouse type panel is on the lesser end of the spectrum. The Nietzsche are some of these other panels that allow a lot of really nice intricate work are incredibly expensive. And so just because you want to get rid of brick and go to panels doesn't mean that you're helping you from a cost standpoint. Now then, from a longevity and durability, again, you've got a, a masonry product, a metal product. They're, they're, they're there that are going to last for a while, and that's an, something we'll talk about here in a second, as well as some of the applied finishes as well, again, depending on location where those, where those are and the contact that comes with that. The second chart there has, again, to do with the exterior wall coverings, but this is more of an applied finish. It's, it's kind of, again, a no-brainer. Paints and things that go onto the exterior of a building don't last as long as something that's got color all the way throughout like a brick would. And so again, that's, that's kind of what those basic um, breakdowns are from that standpoint. Our, our charts on, on slide eight basically look at life expectancy. Again, you know, stone, hard materials do last longer. That doesn't mean you don't ever have to touch them. There's gonna be some cleaning and some things that, that happen from that standpoint as well as your metal panels and sheathing. The other applied finishes can, from the, from the system itself, stay on there. They just require some maintenance throughout the life of that, that project. And so that's something that, again, in five to 10 years, typically you're either applying, touching up, cleansing, whatever it may be required of that particular product to man, manufacture that warranty or hold that manufacturer's warranty from that standpoint. 
So slide nine is one that um, is, is local market data from folks that we have here in the central Arkansas region. And what we looked at is this is typically what we would, we would start doing some analytics on a project of any given type if we're looking at kind of studying the envelope of the building. And so again, looking at masonry, different panel systems and applied finishes. And you can see kind of the current market rates for range of cost for what that would be on a face square foot of that particular product for a building, as well as the life expectancy of what this is basically what's going to be warranted by the manufacturer. That's something that's gonna be prescribed by the design team. We have to adhere to it. Manufacturers follow that. And so this is what they're, they're guaranteeing their product for, and that's the leg you have to stand on. And that third column being the typical maintenance required for those products. As you'll see, you know, again, masonry is going to have minimal uh, requirements. It, you know, obviously, if you're on a, a north facade that's got a lot of shade and, and water, you're going to have to clean it because it will mold and get some things. But again, it's it's minimal cleaning. The panels, again, like we talked about, the panel itself is very durable. It's metal. It's not something that's just going to fall off. However, depending on how those systems are applied to the envelope of the building, there are different gaskets, there's different attachment points, there's all those different things that make up that system that you heard the design team refer to as far as how that, how that happens, what that structure is behind it. Those elements can and do require some level of maintenance. Again, that's why you see the 20 year life expectancy for the majority of those. And it really just depends where you see some, some changes in that a little bit it has to do again, if it's a fiber cement panel and it's got an applied paint to it, at some point you're gonna to have to paint it again because the paint only lasts for so long. That doesn't mean the panel isn't going to still be there, but your finish won't. And so there's things like that that it's, it's not as simple to just do a blanket statement for what that may be. And same for your applied finishes with, with EFIS exterior paint. Again, those, those can range depending on the manufacturer as far as you know, 10 to 15 years on, on most EFIS products. There may be some different ones out there. And then the paint as well, again, it depends on the product the method of the application, how great they are from that standpoint. But it's, again, it's fairly common to, to have to go back and have some level of maintenance. The reason I kind of keep harping on maintenance versus some of those initial life cycle costs have to do with that second graph on that same slide. Is you'll see that all of a sudden, it kind of levels the playing field a little bit. Whereas brick and standard masonry has a higher initial upfront cost with them having a lower overall operational maintenance cost when you look at the life cycle of a building, that starts leveling out from a cost standpoint. Whether that really means anything to you all or not, I'm not sure. But from a from a from a builder or an owner, where that comes in, that that really helps and does make some difference. Because again, I know that you've got to have dollars on day one. But if you're holding and maintaining this building or structure for a limited time, I mean, you've you've got to want to know what those costs are. Some other things there too, though that. Again, not to not to harp on the panels, but they are there is an expense typically or they're going to be again depending on what that range could be, and then where that maintenance comes in. So it kind of skews that a little bit. Now then again, as I said, you know this is based on a 60-year building. That's a pretty long structure type, but that's what most buildings I would I would say are are, are designed towards a 50 or 60-year um, life cycle from that standpoint. So again, that's that's good information that's again based here in the central Arkansas area from the costing, life expectancy, and what we're seeing in buildings within the, the central Arkansas market. Um, from there, again, there's some more charts and data there. The, the, the last one I would, I would kind of comment on there on, on slide 10 would have to do with your O&M, kind of your operation and maintenance. So obviously, the higher the percentage, the more that that's going to take money on down the road from that standpoint, not necessarily a day one dollars. Again, it's something that, that trying to, to focus in on, on what's going to be, you know, how well that project's going to withstand the test of time. And that's basically what that should be a good indicator for from that standpoint. Um, the, the data from, the, from the, the unit cost, that's somewhat dated. Um, so I wouldn't rely on that because this is, again, this came from that Florida study. So that's not something that's indicative of the market here for us. But that's, that's kind of what we're seeing, at least across the board for most of the common envelope materials that we're seeing today from the, from the hard surfaces. We could talk about some of the glass and glazing, those sorts of things if we need to. Again, those systems are, are pretty equivalent to what's, what else is up here from the uh, longevity standpoint. Again, once it starts getting into your maintenance and those sorts of things, you're going to have seals, gaskets, and whatnot that would have to be addressed. But 
they're they're still a good viable and durable product from there. So I'm sure there's a couple of questions from that slight dissertation. Nietzsche Hoff. Can you spell that, please? Oh, gosh. Or, I shouldn't have asked. You, you can tell me later. I can tell I, you later. I, will, I, will, I know you can do it. I, we don't have time to do it right now. You can tell me later. We'll, we'll Google it for you. All right. So with, with some of these pro products, and you kind of alluded to it, that how it's installed and and, and perhaps the, the quality of and, and I'm very simplistic here. Like, how thick is it, and how, um, what is it made up of internally? I'm, I'm sure there's different levels of quality. Is that something that you could see that we could incorporate in where it would expand the possibilities but kind of maintain a standard? Um, I, I would think that that I may defer to our, our friends in the architectural side of things is how they specify a product. But using a metal panel as an example, the, the gauge of the metal or the thickness of the metal dictates basically how rigid it is. And you can get one that's very thin and slightly more economical, but the aesthetic in the end is not going to be what they want or what you want. That's where you hear the oil canning and those sorts of looks. And so again, that comes down to the product that the, your design team would either specify or detail from that standpoint. But then also too, the details and level that they provide for that installation of whatever it may be, whether it could be as, you know, brick needs to be installed correctly, even though it's it's a good hard product. If it's not tied back and structurally sound, it's not gonna be there for the long haul either. And so a lot of that as a standard would, would have to apply, I think would more air towards their side of expertise, at least in my opinion, from that standpoint. So, but yes, there there are some, some things that if you're looking at allowing certain elements or materials, you should probably have some range that, that's allowable if that range applies, correct. Mark, are you gonna speak or is No, the, the only okay. thing I wanted to make sure is that um, there's a lot of terms being thrown out. Um, EFAS and stucco, stucco, drive it, um, that y'all understand the difference there. So before, before there was EFAS, it was stucco, and that's a cement-based product that's applied. Um, but EFAS is actually EIFS, Exterior Insulated Finish System. It's a type. Um, it applies to everything. Drive it is a brand of that. Stowe is a brand of that. So uh, just so you didn't, don't get confused by you know, us throwing out those names and those terms. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Walden, you're up. <clears throat> Use some PowerPoint. Give me a second. We we got pictures. Miles of pictures. Oops. There we go. All right. So based, based on the last meeting and kind of understanding where some of the feedback was with that, what I went ahead and did was I, I developed a building material survey, or rather I shouldn't, I shouldn't take <laughs> credit for it. Kyle developed a <laughs> building material survey uh, asked him to, to develop that. Uh, we got a list of about 130 architects that we could track down con contact information from uh, across the state and kind of distributed that survey uh, to them. We got about 36 responses back. It was a pretty short survey, uh, seven, seven questions, but I thought I would kind of go through some of that and then also talk about uh, some of the materials so that we kind of have a common understanding of what those, some pictures of what, what they look like. So the first uh, question that we asked uh, of them was, do you support the current city economy requirement for 50% masonry? Overwhelmingly, they did not. Um, so in the disagree, in the strongly disagree category, we had about 58% of folks that said they didn't think that that was a good requirement. 
um, about 22% were neutral, and then it, less than 20% overall thought that it was either something they agreed with or strongly agreed with. Uh, so overall, they, the, the architecture community really does not like the 50% 50 50 masonry requirement. Next, I'll kind of go through some of the different materials because the second question that we asked was, which of the following materials do you think are high quality materials? Um, so the, the ones that we looked at were glass. Uh, so this is sort of an example. Glass would be just normal glazing on a, on a building, windows. There's also glass panel systems. Uh, there's systems like that are on the, the outside of the, the Clinton Library. That's an example. Uh, next was, was natural stone. Uh, so there's, there's natural stone that you can use as, as stacking that you might put on the, the outside of it. And then there is a stone veneer or a synthetic stone. A lot of times those, the natural stone versus the synthetic stone is, is difficult to tell apart. Uh, but those are two types of materials that kind of have a, a similar, uh, similar appearance in some ways. You have to get up close to kind of uh, differentiate those a lot of times. Uh, next is brick, which you're, you're pretty familiar with. This is an example of a, of a new construction. I don't know where this is, but I just stole it off the internet. Um, of a new construction with brick. Uh, thin brick, that's another one we asked about. Uh, thin brick has a variety of installation methods. This is uh, one of them, but it's a sort of one way that, that uh, masonry is ad adhered to a surface rather than the kind of the traditional method that you see with normal brick construction. A lot of times it's called a, a thin brick veneer, uh, but there's multiple construction methods. Split face block. Uh, so this is uh, this is one that you see really common on large large buildings. A lot of times, a lot of times, folks will will put split face block on and then paint it. Uh, but this is kind of what what that is when we talk about split face block. Uh, ground flat ground face block. Uh, this is another example where you basically it is a um, a masonry unit, but it's either got a polished front or some type of flat front where it it looks like that. It's it's different than what you typically see with like a just a cinder block. It's it's slightly different. Where does that apply? Under our current guidelines, does that qualify as masonry? I I think there's been some staff in the past that have have not interpreted it in that manner. Um, so. Well, you're that ties my hands to past interpretations. <laughs> well, do I do I do I think it looks attractive? I do. Well, I, I like it. My my thought. I mean, this whole time, my thought of a brick. I'm not talking about the, this size square brick. The split face block works. That works. I mean, the the rock. I mean, that's all. I mean, to me, that's all. Masonry. Yeah. yeah, it's all masonry. I mean, this is masonry. If we're not allowing this. This should be allowed as masonry, in, in my opinion. David, this is the uh, what I was calling burnished block. Yeah. It's a concrete block that's specially finished, I mean, and it does look. I agree with you. It looks good to me. I mean, so I, I just want to. We just okay. want to say that. Yeah, thank Sorry. you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the, yeah. There was an interpretation made previously that I did not agree with, but uh, anyway. Um, so that's that's ground face block, um, precast concrete. Uh, this is. This is one form of precast concrete. There's also lots of other forms of precast concrete that, that can be a lot more architecturally de uh, defined and, and more intricate. Um, tile, uh, so there are tile systems. This is one example of a, a tile system. Uh, th these aren't, I, I don't know of them being real common, but, but they are used. Uh, EFIS, this is this is an example of of EFIS. Uh, some you know EFIS can either be flat, it can be scored. There's different different applications of EFIS. A lot of times that you'll see. Uh, I, I, I do not know. Someone else would probably be better to. Okay. Uh, stucco. Uh, Stucco is a, this is another, stucco often has a, a very similar appearance to EFIS. This, a lot, oftentimes EFIS is called synthetic stucco, uh, but this is, it's kind of a, a traditional, it's a three-step application process. Fiber cement panels. Uh, so when we talked about Nietzsche, uh, 
Um, this is this is what we're talking about with these. This is for a lot of large urban buildings. This has become a go-to material. Um, it's got the the wood look finish that's on there, used in a variety of colors. Uh, this is one that that has become really really popular. This this type of paneling system. So, N I C H I H A. Um, in terms of a fiber cement panel, uh, it is not currently considered masonry. It's not that it's not an allowed material, but it's not a 50% material. Yeah, ironically, ironically, it's, it would, it's, if you are within the, the downtown district, it's easier to use that downtown than it would be uh, elsewhere outside of the outside of that district uh, because because of the fifty percent masonry requirement. Uh, so fiber cement panels, there are other brands as well, uh, but that's that's one. Uh, vinyl siding, this is included. I, I think we're we're all all familiar with it. I actually had a very difficult time trying to find a a commercial application of, of vinyl siding. Uh, not, not real often. I'm not even sure that's in America, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, wood cladding. Um, this is sort of a, an example. Uh, if you, uh, a, good, a good example that's been used recently is Whitewater Tavern in, in Little Rock. If you're into dive bars, that they reclad that. But this is a kind of a material uh, where that's that's used metal panel uh, so when we talk about our panel or our panel this is what the traditional R panel is uh, this is oftentimes people say it, it's just regular metal panel and then distinguished from architectural metal panel uh, it oftentimes has uh, you know exposed fasteners which is the the typical there's you can also do it with uh, concealed fasteners as well uh, so that that's kind of what when you say just traditional metal panel, that's what we're talking about. Uh, ACM, uh, so these are uh, composite uh, panels, it, it, architectural composite panels. The, these could have metal, it could be uh, other material, but this is another one. Uh, examples like a Luke Albon that you see uh, go on a lot of car dealerships and such. Uh, those are real, real common. Uh, so this is this is that. What they were saying about different gauge materials, you know, I've, I've had friends who have used uh, that that metal paneling on their house, and if they don't get it thick enough, it it develops that waves and dimples and and all of those sorts of things that go in it. So, uh, so the question, so that's kind of the primer for the for the second question: which of the following materials are are high quality? So we had about thirty six respondents. Um, you know, with the with the questionnaire, uh, the ones that were, I think, the leading four leading were glass, natural stone, brick, uh, and composite slash composite metal panels. That ACM type metal panel, those were the ones that, that seemed to be the the greatest amount of uh, concurrence on. Uh, and then followed by precast concrete, uh, stone veneer, ground face block. Uh, tile, stucco, three coat, fiber cement paneling, uh, and then towards the bottom of the list, vinyl siding didn't didn't get a whole lot of love. Ephus didn't get a lot of love. Uh, split face concrete block didn't thin brick uh, or traditional R panel. So if we're asking them, um, you know, oh wait, that's a, that's another question. Uh, so I, well, let me let me go to sort of the question four, because it directly relates to question two. So what exactly, in their consideration, makes something a, a high quality material? Again, we had about 36 respondents. So the, the number one was, is it durable? That was the, that, that's the main question. Is it a durable material? Uh, second was sort of aesthetics. Um, with it, it, does it, is it attractive? Uh, and then, you know, the third place with that was, was craftsmanship. Uh, sort of the quality of the, the, the make. And then there were, we had sort of open response uh, for seven other comments there on what makes things uh, a high quality material. So 
you know, with that, based on the, the quality materials, are there ones that should be avoided on commercial construction? Uh, so again, 36 respondents, the majority said, do not put vinyl siding uh, on commercial construction. Uh, EFIS was, was two thirds of the respondents said, don't put that on commercial construction, uh, followed by metal panel and then and wood cladding. And there was eight other responses uh, as well. Um, are there materials that should be avoided on, on highly visible facades? So with this, this question, this, is, this again goes to how you construct uh, regulations for this. In the agree or the strongly agreed, so two thirds said that yes, there are materials that should be avoided uh, on highly visible facades. So something that's the front facade or something that you're gonna see from a roadway. Two thirds of the folks said yes, uh, agree in some fashion. Uh, neutral was about 11%. And then around 20% 20, 20 or so uh, disagreed uh, or strongly disagreed with that statement. Um, high quality materials should be used for highly visible facades. Uh, in that, there was a, a, a lot of consensus. Uh, actually, in one of the following, one of the people says, I object to this question because it, <laughs> it should always be used. High quality materials should be used for all facades. It was, it was kind of a funny response. Um, but in the strongly agree, in the, the agree category, you can see an overwhelming response for high quality materials should be used for highly visible facades with that. And then there was I, I probably one respondent that said dis, they disagreed uh, out of that that I, that I can tell of. Nope. Oh, sorry. I got a duplicated slide there. So question six was kind of some, some open response um, with that. And with the open response, it said, are there any materials not currently allowed or discouraged that should be allowed? And uh, there were some, some really interesting responses here, things that related to, you know, we need to be more open to metal paneling. We need to, uh, you know, wood look metal panels. So Mac metal, the Trespa, uh, Nichiwa, or Nichiha, um, it says, you know, in certain areas of town, like industrial parks, it doesn't make sense for a building to use such high quality materials. You know, we don't need to have a one size fits all approach. Um, and then, you know, thinking about the context of the structure. So those, those were some things that, that were, I think, important. Um, and then the comment there, 50% masonry requirements are really limiting. Um, a facade made of 100% glass and ACM panel would be long lasting, high quality, very nice design, but can't do it in Conway. Um, and then is there anything else that we should know? And there, there were a bunch of responses. Uh, these were kind of a, a few that, that stuck out. Uh, it's very difficult to apply, you know, one situation in all circumstances. Uh, it doesn't always have to be a high-end material to have a, a good design to it, uh, but it should be quality. So just, just being by virtue 50% masonry doesn't mean that it is necessarily going to result in good architecture. Um, somebody then said, you know, base requirements for building materials is important, but, it, but nothing can substitute for the client hiring a good architect. Uh, that that's, always, that's always really, really important. So imagine an architect saying that you need to hire a good architect. I, I, you know. Um, Allowable materials should be determined by the, the property, location. Uh, again, you know, really thinking about context. They said prescribing materials makes a decision simpler, but can maybe more damaging than looking at the overall quality of the design, uh, which I, I, I thought is, you know, is interesting. Um, design is subjective. You know, durable quality materials should be the aim of every architect. Developers often have ROI goals that lower the quality materials. Uh, the city should hold firm on requiring quality, quality materials that, that enhance appearance of the city. Um, this one, EFIS and vinyl are, are known cheap materials. There's a reason insurance companies charge a premium when EFIS is on a building. Uh, says products are cheap to purchase and install but are not meant for long-lived structures. Uh, another one, metal paneling cuts both ways because though it's often used in in a really unintentional low quality way, it can be well detailed and intentionally modern building. That's something I would say, you know, relating to uh, visiting Northwest Arkansas, 
when I worked in Bentonville um, in 2004 to 2007, you didn't see very many metal, metal buildings. And the Faye Jones Architectural School has, has they, they pray at the, you know, the metal panel, uh, God to the metal panel now in, in a lot of ways. But the, the result of that is that there are a lot of really, really cool uh, structures that are very well architecturally designed that, that use that. We sent a, a, out an email, yeah, to architects. So what we did was we we compiled, we went into. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. We, basically, the most of the major architecture firms uh, in in the state is who we sent it out to. What we could what we could get contact information for. Uh, and then, again, you know that last comment. Uh, there needs to be a review of the property where it falls to establish if that building or addition falls within the, the high quality product zone or lower quality zone. Uh, so, you know, there, there could be something in place similar to the, the HTC submission that requires photos of the existing building surrounding. So there's a lot of comments about how it fits within the context of the, the surrounding area. So, you know, based on the results of that that survey and then additionally some of the conversation that we have that that you all had uh, previously the one of the in the building material uh, report that we produced last time one of the things i saw was an observation that uh, you know based on what i'm what i'm hearing there was a particular community that that regulated things in a way that i think might make sense for how we would want to do that uh, and that was Olathe, Kansas. Uh, so they've they basically break down classification of materials by quality standards. So they've got class one materials, class two, uh, class three, class four, a variety. Uh, their requirements vary by facade wall. Uh, so they're most stringent on the primary facades. When you get to secondary facades in the back, uh, they they become less stringent. Uh, they specify a minimum glazing amount. So you got to have a, a certain amount of glazing. Uh, particularly for for commercial structures, uh, that's that's really, I think, very important. Uh, having glazing is, I think, one of the most important things. They allow a lot of a variety of materials, uh, but they set th minimum thresholds for the usage of quality materials. So they define, they go in, they define what are what quality materials are, and they say, you know, eighty percent of the building or seventy percent of the building's got to be composed of at least two quality materials, and then. You know, you've got a minimum glazing amount, and then beyond that, it's whatever whatever you want to use, really. So I, I thought that was a sort of an interesting way. And then additionally, they vary their requirements by building use type, uh, which I think is one of the things that we we end up getting in a lot of a lot of conflict here is uh, ours are defined by zone, but it's not necessarily defined by the the use type of the structure. So. You can you can build industrial in commercial, um, and then you know not be able to to have sort of the an easier path that you might have with building an industrial area otherwise. So I thought that was I thought that was pretty interesting. Excuse me, Jack. We're out of time tonight. I, I did figure we would have to have another night of this, uh, probably another committee meeting in the near future. I've asked Miss Smith if uh, she won't give me an answer yet, uh, if she would chair a committee and work with with. Uh, with you and and uh, she's got a lot more experience in construction, I think, than, than the rest of us here. Uh, but I, if I can talk Miss Smith into doing it, even though she is a lame duck, uh, <laughs> we we might can talk her into. It. I know Mr. Hawkins had something he wanted to ask of the council, uh, but uh, Rick and and Mark, I appreciate y'all coming out tonight, and uh, we will have to have another night. This, Mr. Hawkins, five minutes additional time, if I could. There's a gentleman here that has come from out of state uh, to speak about a construction uh, material that has been referenced several times this evening. This has always been a body. This has always been a body who has listened to information. And I would like to ask for five minutes if I could, please. And I, it'll be entirely up to the council, Mr. Hoggins. I did turn down another group tonight, and I wanted to say let the council know that. Sure, and I, I and had I, put my request in almost two weeks ago. And I know, and then I responded 
last Wednesday that the docket was full and that we would need to schedule another night. So, but it's up to the council. I would like, I would like to ask for your indulgence if I could, please. Are we gonna have another night of this, do you think? Yes. Can, can we not just have them speak at it? Well, I mean, they're, free. they're here from out of state. They're here from out of state. And, and you know, I'm sorry that I look at a particular email account all the time. That's my fault. Oh. That's my fault. Uh, James uh, is here all the time. We could have James, done James's portion at any time during any of this process. I'm going to close my mouth. And we did, but we had it scheduled it's that way. That, that's the way we had it scheduled, and that, that falls on me because my office scheduled everything. It's up to you. Okay. It's five minutes. Give me five minutes. It's not. Thank you very much. Would y'all be able to make the next meeting? In two weeks? Are we going to schedule the committee meeting two weeks? I missed it. What was the North Little Rock comment? They were from North Little Rock, he said. Oh, they're in North Little Rock? Uh -huh. okay. They, no, okay. They have purchased a piece of property. Well, they purchased Wild River Country uh, mm -hmm. that has been very prominent. And, yeah. and they're doing uh, the golfing situation. Mm -hmm. It's not Top Golf, but it's a, a knockoff of that uh, that would be here. The gentleman is standing right here right now. Yeah, I'm a manufacturer representative. You've, uh, it was mentioned quite a bit. I do have a presentation. It would take longer than five minutes. Actually, it wouldn't probably even start in five minutes. It's yeah. only, so coming back, I, I welcome. I have no problem coming back in. It's very important. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of things. And Keithman has been updated from previous impressions of what each industry is doing now. A hundred eight billion dollar industry uh, alone the world uh, so it, it's very prominent it's not going away parts of the country it dominates north little rock it does not that's one thing i was going to explain and show you projects that are around and local have changed your mind about the durability there's just like someone's mentioned there's ways of doing things there's the wrong way the intermediate way is the right way so, so i don't mind coming back which which uh material are you talking about Ease. Okay, if you would give Mr. Walden get, get your contact information and we will put you up first batter. Okay. Yeah, because I can answer tons of those questions today. Yeah. What are, what are you I love all the questions. I'm from Tulsa, so it's not too bad to drive up here, four hour drive. Um, so I welcome to come back. I just got to check my schedule if I'm out of state. I handle six state of companies, so I just got to make them available. This is high priority. Yes, this so yeah. Miss Smith, I haven't got an answer from you yet. I, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry uh, you traveled that far. Yeah, I am to, too. To come, uh, Council, let's take uh, let's take three minutes and then and get get started.
Good evening, everyone. We proceed each council meeting with a word of prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would like, please feel free to join us. And Miss Isby, could I get you a word of prayer, please, ma'am? If you'll bow with me. Our gracious Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord, for this community and this city that you have blessed us to be stewards of. We just ask, Lord, for your wisdom and your guidance in making decisions and we just ask, Lord, that at the end that you get the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Now I'll call this meeting to order. Mr. Garrett, would you call the roll, please, sir? Mr. Hawkins? Mr. Grimes? Here. Ms. Tucker? Here. Ms. Mel? Here. Ms. Smith? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Ms. Isby? Here. You should have received copies of the April 12, 2022 City Council minutes. Any corrections or changes or comments? Make a motion for approval as submitted. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes as submitted. No further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mr. Ledbetter is out of state. That passed seven to zero. Do we have a group from UCA with us tonight? And what, what group? Is that Ms. McDonough? I see you in there again. <laughs> I'm sorry? Advanced reporting. Advanced reporting. All right. Well, welcome. First, we have our monthly financial report uh, that ended on March 31st. I sent an email out yesterday uh, with some good numbers back on our, our latest sales tax. Mr. Winningham. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. <clears throat> uh, sales tax for March was, uh, you won't hear me say this very much, it was down relative to other months and it was only up about 10%. Uh, used to 10%, 9.8 really. Uh, that was usually a really good month for us, but the effect we've seen over the last year, you know, we've averaged 20 to 25. And just this year, January was up 26, February was up 21. And those months last year were up about that same, you know, over 2020. So we're still on a pretty good roll, and the, the numbers we got for uh, in April for February sales, we're back up in that 20% range again. So uh, I, I figured we would bounce back, and, and hopefully that trend will continue. Uh, the other, other thing I might point out, you'll see we've got a new revenue line there, three down, the utility tap fees. That's something we've not had previously. I have a limited understanding of that. The mayor, you might be able to explain it better than I can, what that revenue is. That is, is that the one we established with common corporation so that when a, the city owns a uh, sewer line that goes from uh, roughly there on South Donny up to the fire station and then the one we're putting in on Farber Lane. If E1 taps into that, they will pay their tapping fee. Normally they would pay us for it, but instead this council established where they will pay that fee, that money will pay to be paid into common, uh, common corporation. They will keep that money and they will use that for tap fees for low to moderate income neighborhoods or neighbors in the future. That's that's what that is. It's on the list, man. Hey, it's out of our hands. You got you're gonna have to call Brett Carroll. <laughs> hey, but you've been approved. <laughs> So my only other uh, note that I made to bring up to the council was on the airport fund. You see that it's showing a, a negative bottom line there, a net expense for the year. That's due to uh, when Mr. Bell retired, we paid out his sick and vacation. That was an unbudgeted uh, payroll expense. So the fund should bounce back from that as we go through the year and hopefully nothing to be concerned about there. And that's all I've got. Tyler, I just have one quick question. Yes, ma'am. Um, in the fund balance, the 
balance sheet for the general fund, mm -hmm. the cash balance there, how much of that is the money we've received so far from like, I know we got what the 2.3 that we took as reimbursement during COVID. Mm -hmm. So that would, that was reimbursing for expenses that we did. Correct. And then we've got the first part of the of the 12? rescue plan funds. Okay. So is that in there? No, ma'am. Okay, so we have not. Where no, is that reflected? I guess it's in the grant fund. So okay. it's in the set of numbers that you see quarterly. Okay. And we should get the second round of the rescue money in June. Does that sound right? They said not sooner than a year after you get your first round, and okay. we got our first round in September. Okay. So okay. probably be sometime between September and the end of this year. So that's when we, we would, would we then take it out of the grant fund and appropriate it into here, or would it just it's going to stay in the grant separately? It, it will stay in the fund. grant fund because we'll have to it's show that we've to, not got yeah. that commingled yeah. with general funds. But uh, when we do get ready to uh, obligate for projects and spend it, we'll just do it within the grant fund. Okay, but the two point three that we d that did come in because that under that reimbursed us for. Police and fire, right, that's right. what we claimed as okay. reimbursement on that was police and fire sure salaries. Yeah. And we, we used a portion of that for the uh, one-time bonuses last year. Mm -hmm. So there's about 1.6, 1 1.7 left. And it is in that okay. operating cash balance yep. in the general fund. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I make a motion to approve the monthly financials. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve the fi uh, monthly financials, which ends in March 31st, 2022. Any further discussion? Mr. Garrett. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed. Okay, so seven to zero. Thank you, Mr. Winningham. Next, we have community development. Mr. Hawkins, I'll turn this portion over to you. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the nomination of Ray Williams for the uh, Conway Housing Authority Board. Any further discussion? Mr. Garrett. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Passes seven to zero. Mr. Hawkins. Uh, this, uh, this ordinance for this item, A2, is mistakenly left off the agenda. Uh, yeah, yeah. It is, it is A2. James, are you speaking to this or Robbie? Okay. I give it a shot. Sorry that I didn't get in the packet. I don't know, know what happened. Um, so this resolution is uh, regarding accepting a grant award from the Department of Agriculture. Um, the, tree, the Conway Tree Board received this grant award and it's for the Urban Community and Forestry Grant. Um, it's in regards to the project uh, for Dave Ward beautif Interstate Beautification Project. Um, I do have kind of a visual rep representation if you guys uh, would like to see that, but um, there's going to be several things done for that interchange um, where, you know, underbrush is, will be cleared up, limbs will be trimmed, and then some more appealing trees are going to be planting, planted along that interchange. <clears throat> um, this grant is for $8,000 um, with um, the Department of Ag, and uh, the tree board has committed to supply some matching funds, and along, I think there's a partnership with the Chamber of Commerce to to uh, support it as well. Any questions? I make a motion for adoption of the resolution. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt this resolution uh, for grants from the uh, Department of Agriculture for the Conway Tree Board. Any further discussion? Mr. Garrett. This be resolution R2224. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. That's a seven to zero. Thank you, Robbie. Robbie doing a great job too. Mr. Hawkins. Next item is consideration to approve a conditional use permit to allow religious activities in A1 zoning, 34 acres, the intersection of Donald Ridge Road and an unbuilt right-of-way Sherwood Lane. This was reviewed by the Planning Commission 
and they voted 7 nothing to move this city council with a recommendation of approval. Yes, yes uh, this is uh, this is for Summit Church. Uh, so they're intending to construct a church out there location. I've got some long range plans additionally with a, a residential component to go with that for for missionary housing. Um, the, one of the, the main issue on this is has been considerations with with access and making sure that there's fire proper fire apparatus access uh, for the, for that location. Uh, but we didn't get any opposition to it at the uh, Planning Commission or anything along those lines. I make a motion to grant this conditional use permit. Second. I have a motion and a second uh, to approve a conditional use permit to allow religious activities in A1 zoning district uh, at the intersection of Donald Ridge Road and Sherwood Lane for Summit Church. Any further discussion? Mr. Garrett. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. This is seven to zero. Mr. Hawkins. Next item is consideration to approve conditional use permit to allow swimming pool sales and service in C1 zone district for property at 611 Court Street, Suite 6. So this, um, uh, we've had a uh, swimming pool sales and service location operate opened up and they, they were confused about whether they were required to have a conditional use permit or not. When, when came in for a sign permit, we, we realized and this is one of those things, uh, similar to what we talked about with the, the office use of, of having some problematic conditional use permits. This is probably one that you'll see us address in the future uh, to maybe do away with that use because uh, it's, it's not a very common use and, and the impacts of it are, are very similar to a lot of others. Uh, there was no opposition to this. Uh, it is a sort of a, a routine action on it. I make a motion to grant the conditional use permit. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve this conditional use permit uh, for 611 Court Street, Suite 6. Any further questions? Mr. Garrett. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Passes 7 to 0. Mr. Hawkins. Next item is uh, Ordinance Rezone 66.87 acres south of Nutter Chapel Road, east of Ridgedale Circle from R1 to PUD. Uh, so this item, uh, this is a previously approved um, subdivision. Uh, they've, they've gone in through and had some uh, issues with design. It's a, it's a pretty challenging property in terms of design. It's currently zoned R1. They've gotten an approved preliminary plat. What they're wanting to do are take the streets private and gate them. Uh, and so that's why they're going through the, the PUD process at this time. So it's uh, no major changes from uh, the plat that's already been approved. Make a motion to look. I'm trying to ask a question. Get my mic on. Are they? They have to follow all the same rules about setbacks and everything else. That as if it it's, was R1. They're, they're right? basically following following all of the normal R1 standards. There's some additional requirements on you know prohibition of certain materials as well. But it's so. mainly due to the streets, right? It's it's 100 due to the streets. Okay, I was yeah. just curious why we were doing HUD. I mean, PUD. sorry, PUD. Thank you. Community? Correct. Okay. Are the fire trucks going to be accessible in there? Yes. So the, they they have to provide uh, sort of Knox box access and, and all of those things whenever we we do something along those lines. They, so they do have to maintain fire. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. We, from my understanding, we do not maintain the streets or anything in a class correct. Area here yeah. Yet. So the the one of the conditions requirements in there is that they they form a property owners associate. Association or Improvement District, which Mr. <laughs> Mr. Garrett came came down to our office with a question about it, um, because w we require that they they set that up. Uh, the main reason is when you when you establish uh, private streets, that in 20 years it's going to be a tremendous expense that goes on for all those those property owners, and so establishing an Improvement District or POA basically allows an annual allotment that they pay in. Uh, that that pays for the future maintenance of those streets because we, anytime that uh, private streets are set up, we want to protect. I, I'm always a, a of the mindset that there are streets that are public streets and there are streets that are waiting to become public streets, particularly if you don't have an adequate uh, funding mechanism for maintenance. And so that that is the particular requirement why we uh, make them set up a POA or improvement district. 
make a motion to waive the three readings. Second. I have a motion and a second to waive three readings. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes seven to zero. Make a motion to adopt three readings. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the ordinance to rezone property located at uh, 1 and 3 Azalea Lane and 65 Azalea Loop from A1 to R2A. Any further discussion? Mr. Garrett. It's the ordinance 02247. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Hawkins? Yes. Ms. Mel? Aye. Ms. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Ms. Isby? Yes. Mr. Grimes? Aye. Passes 7 to 0. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. Did I read the wrong one? My bad. Thank you, Ann. Ordinance to rezone property, uh, 66, yes, uh, 0.87 acres south of Nutter's Chapel Road, east of Ridgedale. Now, I'll, yeah. Uh, I, No, I deserve to be corrected on that one. No, I'm so glad you caught that. Uh, no, no, no. All right, we're, let's get back to business at hand. Nutter Chapel Road of East Ridgedale, uh, circle from R1 to PUD. We have a, mo a motion and a second. Now, again, all in favor say aye. We have passed seven zero. Any, any other discussion? We have a motion for the adoption of the ordinance. Mr. Garrett. I just wanted to go back over to make sure that that I had done everything. Yeah, no. I don't know where that came up from. I promise you. I was look I was I I guess I was looking at an old agenda. Okay. Next we have the public service and uh first up we have an ordinance appropriating insurance proceeds to replace the sunshades at Conway Expo and Event Center. Mary, you'll never let me live that down. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so we had a, <clears throat> we had a vendor do some damage to one of the shade structures along the livestock pavilion. Their insurance has submitted payment on that, and we're just asking for it to be moved over into our maintenance budget so we can get it replaced. So moved. Second. I've confused everybody. We have a motion and a second to waive the three readings. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes seven to zero. Six. I'm sorry, six to zero. I make a motion for the adoption of the ordinance. I have it as 22 Second. I have a motion and a second to approve this ordinance. Any further discussion? Mr. Garrett. Mr. Grimes? Aye. Mr. Jones? Yes. Ms. Mel? Aye. Ms. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Ms. Isby? Yes. Passes six to zero. Next up, we have an ordinance appropriating funds for the additional design of Pompey Park. Mr. Ibsen, and I'm still looking where I came up with that. <laughs> Obviously, it was. This is an addendum. Yep, it was on the last agenda. <laughs> this is an addendum to the contract the council approved previously for Pompey Park. Uh, it will include uh, some geotechnical uh, investigation and reports, along with the design of the Veterans Plaza, uh, some landscape design for the plaza, also. And then uh, the construction documents for parking, the plaza, the pavilion, and electrical design, and the abutments for the pedestrian bridges. I'm and we're requesting additional uh, 41765. 41, I make a motion to waive three readings. Second. I have a motion and a second to waive three readings. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Passes six to zero. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve this ordinance. Any further discussion? Mr. Kerr. Mr. Grimes? Aye. Mr. Jones? Yes. Ms. Mel? Aye. Ms. Isby? Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Ms. Tucker? Yes. Passes six to zero. Thank you, Steve. Finally, we have the Public Safety Committee. First, we have a consideration to approve the disposal of inventory for the Conway Police Department. Chief Tapley's on board tonight. Good evening. How are you all? Well, I don't know. I'm 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 still on last month's <laughs> agenda. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. 
check it out and see what's going on here? I deserve that. <laughs> so this one's a much easier one. Um, this Easy. <laughs> this one is simply we have a paper shredder that is on our inventory that no mm -hmm. longer works, and we would like to get rid of it. So moved. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve the uh, disposal of this inventory. Any further discussion? That's okay. Mr. Garrett. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed. Passes six to zero. And Mr. Mister Jones, uh, Mr. Uh, Carroll told me he would give me an answer tomorrow on the time. I texted him. I'll never live that down. Next up, we have Norton's Appropriating Reimbursement Funds from various entities for the Conway Police Department. Chief Tapley. So we have uh, funds that we have uh, been reimbursed for for extra duty services, donations, and insurance proceeds. We're just asking to appropriate these into the um, appropriate accounts. Second. I have a motion that we waive the three second. I have a motion and a second to waive the three readings. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes six to zero. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt this ordinance. Any further discussion? Mr. Garrett. Ms. Mel? Aye. Mr. Jones? Yes. Ms. Smith? Yes. Mr. Grimes? Aye. Ms. Tucker? Yes. Ms. Isby? Yes. Passes six to zero. Next, we have an ordinance uh, waiving the competitive uh, bid requirement and, and appropriating asset forfeiture funds for various equipment for the Conway Police Department. Chief Tapley. So this one gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, we are asking to spend some funds uh, from our asset forfeiture for a couple of different projects we have going on. Uh, one of them is for an LPR system that's a license plate recognition or license plate reader system. Um, we are asking for you to, to accept SkyCop as a sole source provider. And the reason we're doing that is they, um, they're used in several of the surrounding cities. Uh, and this will allow us to, to use information uh, from them and them to use information from us. Um, so that's why we are asking to go to them. Um, in addition to that, we are, we are looking to start doing some of the light maintenance on our fleet vehicles. Uh, that would, of course, uh, require us to buy some equipment such as a lift, uh, tire machine, things of that nature. Again, we're asking... Uh, be able to spend that out of our asset forfeiture. And then finally, uh, we are sending our SWAT team to a specialized school this year. Uh, and part of that school is uh, a significant amount of ammunition and uh, equipment. And we're asking to spend $14,000 on that, sending them to that school. And council, uh, I asked uh, Chief Tapley and Alderman Grimes, we visited about this a while back. Uh, Alderman Grimes actually had a, a location for us at one time that has since passed, but the uh, folks that have been doing a lot of the maintenance work for the uh, police department is going to be uh, retiring. So uh, Chief and uh, Joe Hopper have been working together. Uh, hopefully when the, uh, we take over the Conway Corporation building on South Hark Rider, that will give us room for a, uh, a place where we can do all of our maintenance on our trucks and mm -hmm. Buying a lift uh, will be a part of that. They will use it somewhere else in the meantime. But uh, moving forward, uh, that's what that's what the city is shooting for is is doing our own maintenance. And David had us a great building. We just uh, time wise, it just didn't work out for us. Second. I have a motion and a second to waive the three readings. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? It passes six to zero. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt this ordinance. Any further discussion? Mr. Garrett. Mr. Grimes. Aye. Ms. Mel. Aye. Ms. Smith. Yes. Ms. Tucker. Yes. Mr. Jones. Yes. And Ms. Isby. Yes. Passes six to zero. And next we have an ordinance. There's a correction of this. The company name should be listed in the ordinance as Vision Data Spaces. Uh, this is an ordinance waiving the competitive bid, bid con requirement and appropriating funds to replace the backup battery system at the Conway EOC in chief. Didn't we look at this a couple of years ago? This actually started, I believe, in February of 2020. Okay. Uh, you guys appropriated the funds at that point. 
we had been trying to get somebody to fulfill this for us for that period of time now. Uh, we didn't, we had people that just weren't calling us back. We couldn't get quotes. Uh, it has been quite the ordeal over the past almost two years. Um, we have finally gotten a good quote uh, from Vision uh, for this money. Uh, the money that you appropriated originally, because we didn't spend it, it didn't roll over and it went back into the fund. Uh, so we're basically asking to reappropriate the money uh, so we can do this. This system, the backup system, is what, if I understand it correctly, uh, in between the time that the power would go off and our generator would kick in, this is what keeps our computers and things up so that uh, we don't have that, that downtime. So. Does the county pick up any of this cost? So my understanding is that they did originally in 2020. Yeah, they they donated right. some funds to this. Okay. All right. Second. We have a motion and a second to waive the three readings. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes six to zero. Make a motion for the adoption of the ordinance of 22 and approving the emergency. Second. We have a motion and a second to adopt this ordinance with the emergency clause. Any further discussion? Mr. Garrett. Ms. Tucker? Yes. Mr. Grimes? Aye. Ms. Smith? Yes. Ms. Isby? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Ms. Mel? Aye. And the emergency clause, Ms. Tucker? Yes. Mr. Grimes? Aye. Ms. Smith? Yes. Ms. Isby? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Ms. Mel? Aye. Those both pass six to zero. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. All right, Council, that's all we have tonight. Uh, Mr. Mayor, one quick yes, update. Sir. The uh, Public Art Advisory Committee met today via Zoom and it is getting, it's James, one of James's many hats he's wearing, he's chairing that right now, but it is making great progress, and I'll tell you that the council and everyone else is gonna love what's coming out of this. It's gonna Good. be really, really cool. Good deal, good deal. Uh, Mr. Jones will be, uh, will be leading the Toady Wody, uh, Toad Suck Square. The Toady Wody. You've never done the Toady Wody? Yeah. Eight a.m. Uh, Friday morning. <laughs> well, anyway, Toad Suck Days is coming up. Everyone's first time. It's been back in two years, so I hope that uh, that everyone enjoys it. I know our city department's been working hand in hand with the chamber uh, to get things up and running. So that's all we have. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Second. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>